everybody. I'm Mark, for those who don't know me. Um, if you don't know me now, I guess you can still say hi, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm gonna talk uh, about my senior lecture. Um, you know, um, basically I don't have a, I wouldn't say I have a big niche in emergency medicine. Um, I just really love emergency medicine. And most of my residency experience was devoted to just trying to become the best ER doc I can be. Um, so in that sense, um, that's really what I wanted to talk about more than anything. Um, just essentially about the process of residency. Um, also, I kind of like the idea of, ex um, you know, describing your experience in terms of a little bit of a narrative. So hopefully through that, I'll impart some lessons. Um, thanks in particular to Dr. Willis for helping me um, with this talk. I have to do that. Stop it. Stop it. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm a big nerd. Um, the way I'm gonna be kind of framing this experience is through one of my favorite games of all time, which is The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Um, you don't really need to know much about the game other than the fact that it's about re-experiencing the last three days of the world over and over again before the moon crashes into the earth. Um, so that's the story we're gonna use. So hopefully the presentation will feel a little bit less like this. Hopefully not confusing like this. Uh, this guy, I believe he thought he had a dime in his head. That's what I think he told me. Um, and then hopefully by the end of it, not like this. Uh, uh, so uh, let's get started. So by the end of your fourth year of medical school, everything seems like it's building up to this moment. You're nervous, uh, but you're excited for the next chapter. Um, you're a doctor, you got a big fancy new degree. Oh, sorry. Oh, cool. oh, okay. I was not, I did not mean for that to happen. <laughs> Sorry, hold on. Okay. My slides kind of stopped working. I don't know why. Yeah, my slides stopped working. That's okay. So um, we'll start with the dawn of the first day, which we already kind of went through. And then you start your um, residency experience and it feels a little bit like this, like very exciting, very happy-go-lucky. Um, and uh, this is how you experience your first day. Um, but really what it ends up being is more like this. Uh, um, so with that said, I'm gonna start with a case um, that I had very early in my training, which was a 67 um, year old female um, who came in basically with wheezing. She had a history of asthma, bread and butter. I did what every good resident would do. I ordered NEBS, I ordered steroids um, and I moved on with my day, but she started getting worse. Um, she started, um, you know, desatting, uh, was becoming visibly more tachypneic, um, and I got worried, and I froze. Um, and as I panicked with what I was going to do next, um, I remembered a label that kind of stuck with me throughout med school. Um, so another aside for a quick story, I had a patient in the SICU with a ruptured AAA, and in the excitement of the case, I just kind of stood there and observed when all of a sudden I was yelled at by the attendant to get out of the room. Um, after the case, the attendant pulled me aside and said, you know what, Mark, you need to stop being a space occupying lesion. Um, and I come to that experience and reflect on it um, every now and then, particularly when I'm having a low moment um, in my training um, or with a patient, um, which leads me to some of my parting advice, which I'm gonna frame in terms of the mythical object of the Zelda series, which is the Triforce. It stands for wisdom, power, and courage. So we'll start with a little, little bit of wisdom and hopefully some parting advice. So I call um, first year um, essentially the paradigm shift. Um, so this is a kind of a, an article that I read uh, by a PhD that essentially described a few different factors in the transition to residency. The first that she describes is something of a transaction problem. We go through the match, our uh, programs choose us, it spits out a program where we go. Um, and ultimately, was it a mistake? And I definitely thought that it was definitely on the differential. Um, the next is a transfer problem. Um, did my medical school, um, downstate alum, what up? Uh, did they uh, prepare me enough um, for what I was about to experience? And that's definitely a conversation. So maybe it has nothing to do with the residency. It has everything to do with the fact that I just don't know enough. Which leads me to a more popular kind of idea, which is a trajectory problem, which is what we've all heard, which is that no one goes into residency without anything to learn. Um, and uh, you know, for me, you know, the way I think about this, I think about new innovations milestones. Um, and uh, you know, although I've always, I always, and always will cherish the advice from my attendings. You know, ultimately, the numbers on my new innovations were always very esoteric to me. And to this day, I still kind of don't understand what they mean. Um, 
And then there's another perspective that she mentions, which is really more in line with what I was feeling in that moment, um, which is this idea of perspective transformation and that you undergo these critical experiences in your life where you're gonna feel vulnerable, you're gonna feel weak, you're gonna feel deficient. But in hindsight, what's really gonna happen is that you're going to um, learn from that experience and emerge um, better for it. Um, so she specifically mentions critically intensive learning periods, which are situations in which, like I said, you're uncertain, but you use these situations to really build um, on your learning experience and ultimately become um, the professional, the doctor, the educator that you're meant to be. Um, so in my opinion, you have to define your own faults and context and allow yourself to learn. In my case, I needed to realize that I wasn't taking up space. Um, it was a critically intensive learning period in my training where I was internalizing, internalizing my next step in my transition. And now as complaints of asthma and shortness of breath become routine, I'm thankful that I was given the freedom by my attendings to be that space occupying lesion who was now able to manage these complaints routinely. But that leads me to, well, what did I learn from that experience? So she concludes this article really beautifully, I think, with this idea that the progression in training is ultimately about the privilege of taking care of, of patients. When you're in medical school, um, you know, there's a lot of you, 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 you. It's about how can I improve? How can I be better? And I think this leads to a lot of negativity um, and definitely does not promote um, wellness. It was when I realized that looking into what I needed to improve on was for the benefit of my patients. It wasn't how can I improve, it was how can I better help my patients. And changing that perspective made me a lot less anxious and a lot more excited to learn and uh, fill in whatever um, void I needed to learn about. Um, so moving on to some courage. So in those moments when you feel overwhelmed, deficient, and at a loss, um, have the courage to learn how you feel best. If you need to be a passive learner for a bit and learn about a difficult case, take the time to go slow and allow yourself to be vulnerable and appreciate your new role. This experience may be the formative event in your training that creates the stepping stone for years to come. Um, so eventually my, let's see if this works, um, this culminated in my first year and one of my favorite focuses that I did, which was essentially a positive fast in a postpartum patient um, when I was on L&D, believe it or not. Um, and based off of my findings, the patient was rushed to the OR and got an X left, she had hemoperitoneum and she did well. So I ended my first year appreciative for what I learned. Um, so now we're moving on to the dawn of the second day, which is I would call your second year. Let's see if this works. Now it's working, okay, good. So I just like doing that. <laughs> um, and you know, what I like about the music that comes now is it gets a little more, a little more somber. Let's see if it works. Yeah, all right, a little more somber, a little more you're going through the motions. Um, it's kind of, uh, I don't know. I don't know, I get good feelings from that. It's like, you know, it feels very much like second year to me. Now, the other thing is in the game, um, it's called Majora's Mask. So you collect a lot of masks and they all have a lot of different functions um, in your uh, progression throughout the game. And this obviously is a no brainer. This is like, you know, in, sec in second year, we go through all these different off service rotations where we, we gather what we need to, you know, uh, to learn our best. Um, but there is a couple of other things going on. So I told you about the moon, right? And at this point in the game, you look in the sky and you see the moon is much closer than it used to be. Um, you don't exactly know what it is. It's pretty menacing um, and it's coming down kind of quickly. And this could represent any struggle in residency. But for me, it was that looming fear that I was gonna graduate and not be a good doctor. Um, but it can easily symbolize any kind of challenge yet in residency. But perhaps even scarier, there was a new mask um, that was a little bit more menacing. This is actually Majora's mask. Um, and you don't quite know um, what it is. So for me, this clearly symbolizes COVID um, in my eyes. And we didn't understand it and we wanted to protect ourselves. So we donned masks of our own and it was the beginning of a pandemic that ensnared our life uh, for the past uh, two years. Um, and that made residency and the looming fear of finishing or slash not feeling good enough um, even more daunting. And in the heat of the pandemic, in many ways, we lost our sense of progression in our training and we lost the luxury of time. We lost the ability to connect with our patients um, as we were scared in the face of an unknown disease. Uh, we lost our coworkers and our friends. Um, and the burnout was palpable. And this is in a year, second year of your residency that is already not without its fair share of burnout. And this is just kind of a figure um, that shows that the highest kind of degree or change in the amount of burnout that you experience, um, the biggest increase is in your second year. Um, so we were burnt out um, and we were only able to see our patients mass in their own disease. But in order to defeat COVID, we had to kind of make those sacrifices sacrifices to our safety and sacrifices in patient care. 
And I remember during the height of the pandemic, the phone was nonstop ringing by family members of loved ones who were worried about their, their family. Um, and I remember when I got those phone calls, the first thing I felt was annoyed. Did they not know that we were in a pandemic? I'm too busy. There's four other patients coding. People are dying. And then even worse, when patients would come to the ED for their run of the mill complaints, I also became annoyed. Did they not know this was a pandemic? I remember an attending who shall remain nameless during the height of the pandemic famously proclaimed in my mind, no aspirin, no statin, we are in war times. And while provider burnout is an extremely important topic that I'm passionate about, um, it's important to remember that behind the mask and behind the veil of disease um, is a person that when they come to the ED, they're scared. And during a pandemic, they were alone. Regardless of what you felt about the patients or what you, whether you felt their presentation was warranted or not, it took a lot of courage for them to come seek care. Uh, which leads me to my kind of second, uh, you know, kind of lesson um, for uh, that I'm going to tell you about. Um, so my kind of parting advice is beware of cognitive bias and complacency. Um, I'm going to frame this in terms of a model called syndemic theory. Essentially, what it refers to is the fact that there are certain elements of the biopsychosocial mo uh, model um, in caring for a patient um, that essentially promote negative disease interaction and the negative effects of the disease. And there are lots of things that contribute to this. But in brief, um, you know, there are very clearly patient-related factors that, uh, that, that couple onto this that can lead to, um, you know, a patient's first hesitancy to even seek care from you, which are things like racial discrimination, not trusting providers, a fear of cost, chronic illness complicated their presentations. How many of us have had patients where you know that they're here for chest pain, but they're still going to tell you that everything hurts because they have a lot of chronic diseases that they're worried about. Um, and then there are other more social things like concerns over losing employment. Um, and then things that, you know, that really sit a little bit more home with me is provider related factors. So when you are working really hard, when you're in the middle of a pandemic, you're going to rely on your heuristics. And this is only natural. We got to realize the limits of that. So doing things like anchoring, saying, well, looks like COVID must be COVID. Um, employing things like availability, which is, well, everyone has COVID. So this person must have COVID. And then, of course, there's premature closure, which is the most dangerous one of all. COVID test positive, admit for COVID all their labs and all their presentations be damned. But on the flip side of that is there's a reason why we employ these heuristics, which is, as I said, you're pressured for time. You have insufficient information. We have a concern for our safety vis-a-vis -vis a lack of PPE. And there's many more reasons. And honestly, even outside of a pandemic, these kind of um, factors are still in play. So enter kind of May 2020, which was, I would say, is peak burnout for me, um, just after a big surge that we had from COVID. Um, a patient came into uh, the ED complaining of shortness of breath, hypoxemic, you know, looked like COVID, smelled like COVID. Um, and uh, essentially, I admitted the patient for COVID hypoxemia. Um, after the patient was admitted, uh, Dr. Kilpatrick, you know, very astutely was like, you know, let's just do a quick ultrasound. Um, and he ended up having a cardiac vegetation. Um, and he ended up having uh, strep mutans, like a dental, like endocarditis. Um, had to get transferred. That said, I don't want to take away from the fact, like I've been saying, that it takes courage to care for our patients during times of great risk to us all. Interns, second years, third years, seniors, attendings alike, we've all been exposed to this pandemic in some way, shape, or form, and in many ways we had to compartmentalize to survive. Um, we already put our lives on the line for a specialty that is already not without its own risk. But as we discovered more about disease and as we overcame our own biases and frustration, um, we thrived, um, particularly during the pandemic. You know, these are just some examples of our, uh, you know, our little makeshift CPAP that we made when we ran out of, uh, you know, BiPAP machines. Um, and this is just a picture of us, uh, you know, during um, the height of, the, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and after the murder of George Floyd, advocating for our patients, you know, um, and really, um, uh, you know, not being scared um, of, uh, you know, this pandemic and really just still doing what we would normally do to innovate and be the best doctors we can be. And I think we had some fun too. I just like these pictures. Um, we got some monster in the first picture. We got this crazy getup that I'm wearing in the second picture. And then this has already been used, but it's uh, lots of bald people. So it's my people. Uh, and, uh, you know, yeah. So that's uh, kind of second year for you. As third year comes in, and this is my favorite music in the entire game, because it's even more menacing than the second one. And it's just, oh, wait, never mind. After this one, after this, sorry. Wait, let's put that down. Uh, and the music comes. There we go. It's like super terrifying. It's super scary. You're feeling a lot of pressure and the moon's coming down and you're like, oh crap, I'm gonna die. But it's not really, um, you become the senior basically. 
which is its own kind of deal. Um, that said, everyone outside of medicine appears to be celebrating the end of the pandemic, but you see different variants of the same thing, essentially, particularly the Delta variant. And after a significant lull in the ED, patients are coming back in droves, both with COVID and the standard presentations that we have in the ED. You're also dealing with a new wave of misinformation and vaccine hesitancy. Now, becoming a senior resident is daunting in and of itself, but with these added stressors, I found it even more challenging. Um, but I made it out on the other side, and I wanted to kind of talk about some lessons I hope to impart to our seniors, our incoming seniors as well. Um, so the first thing I think about when I became a senior is I thought about this equation, which has kind of stuck out in our head, which is essentially an equation that calculates how many patients per your month of training you should be seeing per an hour. Um, and basically, you know, I think a lot of us equate becoming more senior and being better with speed and efficiency. And this is just kind of uh, where that equation was derived from, which essentially uh, the paper that was derived from, which essentially demonstrates that there's this linear relationship um, between months of training and the amount of patients that you're seeing per hour, um, with the biggest change happening during your first year, um, interestingly enough. Um, so um, that was interesting to me, but it was only based off of a single residency program and study. Um, you know, so I found actually a more recent paper, I think it was in 2021, that looked at four different residency programs. It was a mixture of community and academic um, institutions, um, which essentially um, demonstrated something similar um, in that you see this again, this linear progression, maybe a few more, pa less, few less patients seen per hour, um, you know, but still that kind of linear progression. And it also mentioned things like RVUs, which also demonstrates kind of this upward progression. But I want to dig a little deeper. And when there's another figure that they mentioned in the paper, which is when they separated each residency, this is probably one of my favorite, favorite figures I've ever seen. Because when you separated each residency program, and this is more, it was a, like a, some kind of a, like efficiency productivity number that they were using. But basically you see in the first figure, which is the first program, you see this increase and then decrease. In the second one, you see this plateau where nothing changes in second year. And then you see the third one where there's a steep rise in first year, which is something that we were kind of saying, and then it plateaus. And then my personal favorite one is you start really strong in your first year, and then it's just a steep decline by the end of your residency training. Um, does that mean that we're not seeing more patients, you know, and we're not being more efficient as seniors? I don't think that's what it is. Um, I just think that, you know, equating um, the skill of a resident with how many patients are seeing per hour is probably not the full story. Um, so, you know, for me, the question was, so how do I become that leader? How do I become the, you know, I may not be the fastest. How do I become the senior? So that led me to kind of a paper that kind of discussed different um, models of um, leadership in the ED. And I'm gonna kind of go through them in groups to kind of explain based off of who you're speaking to and who you're leading, um, uh, which kind of uh, model is, I think, uh, I think we're employing basically. So I'm gonna start with our juniors. Um, so I think the best way to educate your juniors in the ED is through this progression from participative to empowering to distributed leadership. So basically participative um, leadership refers to the idea that you're still calling the shots ultimately, right? Um, but you're allowing your juniors to kind of play is the wrong word, but basically learn. And you're still very much supervising them and ultimately making those decisions for them. As they become more comfortable with their standard presentations in the ED, you start empowering them and saying, hey, you don't need me for this anymore. Um, you can do some of this, but uh, you know, on your own. That said, you still kind of, you you still kind of keep a, a shorter distance, shorter distance between you and that resident, because you know you know that they're still learning. Then eventually, as they really become more facile and more um, more in tune with what's happening in the ED, you move on to more of a distributed leadership where you really start trusting them. So that it always struck me how when I told an attending that oh this exam was normal, they would just say okay and trust me. And I think that's uh, that's really the culmination, I think, of the end of your junior years and as you progress to uh, a senior. Um, so I think it's important, which leads me to my next lesson, which is to trust your juniors and empower them, ultimately. I'll never forget, um, you know, when it was me and Hochstein and Sabi diagnosed a pulmonary embolism in a patient where we were just literally saying, it's fine, we're going to discharge the patient. And we just decided, okay, whatever, you know, let's just, let's just, let's, let's just uh, see where this goes. And the patient had a PE. Um, I'll also never forget more recently when I had a patient with Dr. Sinner, um, where there's a patient with abdominal pain sitting in the vertical chairs, of course, um, you know, and there was nothing, uh, you know, there was nothing concerning to me on my exam, but the rotator was concerned. Um, so I was like, you know what, what the hell, like, let's get a CAT scan. You're concerned. I trust your concern. 
So let's see what's going on. And that patient had every single pathology that you can imagine in their belly. And we got really freaking lucky. Um, so give your juniors the freedom to test their theories in line with the evidence, of course, as long as you think it won't hurt the patient. Um, then moving on to a more, uh, more uh, the question that I'm asking myself, how do I become a better ER doctor when I'm seeing my own patients? So that's where you really want to employ things like directive leadership as you're becoming a senior, which is basically more managerial, more I'm calling all the shots. And the way I kind of equate that um, is to act as the director. Um, you know, you know how this place works. Um, as a senior, you're going to be tempted to play the game. You know, certain people are more conservative, certain people are not, and then certain people, um, you know, are in the middle. But try not to play to what your attending likes. Try to play to what you would do as an attending, um, and always advocate for that. Um, your attendings will always, in general, support you, uh, even though they may not agree with you. But maybe still don't get that troponin when this is working. I don't know. Uh, so. Finally, um, kind of ending off, I think once you've really mastered educating your juniors and your own sense of progression as an ER doctor, um, the next kind of phase of leadership is diplomatic. So the way diplomatic kind of works is this idea that there are other factors outside of your specialty, outside of your direct uh, group of peers um, where you need to discuss certain decisions with. Um, and that obviously for me extends to patients, right? So once you know the evidence, once you know what's going on, empower your patients, make them part of the decision-making process and take the times to explain things to them. Um, you'll almost always and only be rewarded in my experience. So we finally arrived um, at the present and this is probably the weirdest thing I'm gonna show you, but by the end of your third year, you may think that the moon's coming down, but you're held up by all of your training. These are just these weird giants that hold up the moon at the end. Um, and uh, basically stop the moon from falling to the ground. So that symbolizes a lot of things to me. Um, symbolizes your, uh, you know, your own skills, symbolizes that you know, you're on the shoulders of giants, basically, um, and uh, you're gonna be okay. So these are my very short fourth year reflections, which almost have nothing to do with each other, but still. Um, I've always remembered this from Dr. J. Always, always, always be nice. Um, as much as it's gonna kill you, event, like it will always pay off. Every time I've gotten angry, it almost never works. We're only human, but you gotta, this is the ideal I strike for in every shift. Um, never give up. Um, as low as you may feel during residency, just remember that you're enough. Um, and just remember that eventually those you might have feared will become your friend. <laughs> um, so that said, I just wanna talk one, end off in just saying thank you um, to everyone in this residency program. Thank you, particularly to my class, um, who've always like you know been on my side and always you know supported me. Um, you know we really are the best group of people, I think. Um, and this is also just in the shadow of the entire residency class. You know you guys are all amazing. You guys are all going to do incredible things. So um, you know thanks for letting me be a part of that process. Um, and then probably lastly, I want to thank my patients. Uh, I think they're the best patients in the world. It's why I stayed here. And it's why I continue to think this is the best place to train in emergency medicine. And yes, a patient actually gave me this gift of the Jews book. Uh, uh, I still don't know why. I mean, I know why, but I still don't know why. Uh, and now as I uh, end off residency, um, you know, the other big thing in this game is time travel. Um, so at the end of those three days, you go back in time um, to the beginning of the first day. So I'm gonna be starting my career as an attending where there's gonna be a bunch of new experiences to go through and uh, yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks for everything. That's it. No questions, cool.